proof that I know what I'm doing. Notice my trigger discipline is the greatest in the world because I know how to, to mentally with people. And I literally destroyed his psyche. Uh, I reach in and take one and put it back, spin the cylinder, close it, and go click. Holy shit, aliens are here. Uh -huh. I haven't paid taxes for 10 years. I never will. So everything I do is crypto. I've been jailed literally in every continent except Africa. I'm so thrilled to be speaking to you in this one-on-one -on -one context, just because I've, you know, I've been writing about technology my entire career. So uh, I, I, I hope you don't mind if we talk about some things that aren't exactly crypto-related, but we will, we will touch on. Crypto. Listen, I'll talk about anything that you want to talk. Great, anything, man. Well, any subject. All right. Let's start with, um, you know, I get, I get crazy emails from all kinds of people. One of them came uh, a few months ago, saying that you had been murdered. And it even included a picture of a body slumped over the floor. And I kind of like, I was like, that, that looks like it might be the back of John McAfee's head. I don't know what this is. I'm very happy to see you alive and well here today. But I'm curious. I, I'm, I'm alive. About... I'm alive. <laughs> I am alive and well. What was your experience of this hoax murder? And were you involved in it, sir? I, I did not murder whoever it was on the floor. Uh, no. You have to understand, I, I have half a dozen doubles around the world. Okay. Um, many of them are, are just like me, um, and they take uh, more drugs than necessary, and, and they drink themselves into a stupor. And I saw that picture, by the way, and uh, it didn't look like a dead person. It looked like someone, because there was vomit all over the floor, it just looked like someone passed out from either too much drinking or an overdose of heroin or something. So no, um, that person was not dead. Um, and uh, was not murdered, and it was not me in any case. That was taken uh, 7,000 miles from, from where I was at the time. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you have enemies like this? What, what, what's the rationale for having doubles? Yeah, I do. I, listen, I mean, I, I'm wanted by five world governments, including the United States, yeah. the most horrific of them. Uh, and in the past year, no, listen, you know, in the past year and four months, they've tried to collect me four times. Uh, first of all, they've tried to collect me in America when they've, you know, convened a grand jury. I found out about it beforehand. So I found out uh, five days in advance that they were convening it. So we left the following day uh, to Florida. We picked up our yacht with Janice, myself, four large dogs, uh, and seven of my staff and sailed away. Went to the Bahamas. Um, we were thumbing up our nose, 90 miles from America, sunning on the beach, uh, tooling around in speedboats, and just having fun. Now, I knew they would come for me, and, and they did. They, they uh, bribed uh, the commissioner of police, Paul Rowe, to arrest us on anything, any charge, in that matter. Then, but by the way, the Bahamas could not extradite us because the Bahamas has no taxes, and therefore, you cannot, it's not a crime not to pay them. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't paid taxes for 10 years. I never will. Um, it's it's uh, illegal I, in my constitution. I, want, I wanted to ask about your specific rationale behind how taxes are illegal. The constitution. The constitution specifically states the government shall pass no laws or make no regulation to inhibit or restrict a person's ability to enjoy the fruits of their labor, meaning uh -huh. you can't go in if they've got a carrot field and have 10,000 carrots and steal one just because you're the government. Do you understand? So if it works for your produce, why the heck can it work for the produce of your work if it's money, right? It's illegal, people, mm -hmm. and unnecessary. Before 1913, there were no taxes in America, and we were the greatest industrial power on the planet. Mm -hmm. They instituted income tax in 1913 as a temporary measure. <laughs> uh, it's still here. And once that happened, we started to diminish. And now, are we an industrial power? No, we have no industry. Our steel mills are gone. We have none. Uh, all of our actual manufacturing, with the exception of a few car companies, which are losing to the Japanese, the Koreans, and the Chinese, and the Germans, um, that's it. We're now a service economy. Can you, can you believe? So no, no, um, it's illegal. We got along much better without taxes. All countries get along better without taxes. You make governments find your own money. That's what we hired you for. Build some roads, get the money, do what you need. But don't steal it from us, for heaven's sake. We didn't elect you to be lazy. We elected you because you're smart. But we don't have any smart people anymore. 
<laughs> so no, it's illegal. Uh, and listen, the Libertarian Party is based on that, for heaven's sake. Mm -hmm. Taxation is illegal. Uh, all of us, that's what we believe. And so, um, yes, but that's, a, that's another point. Gotcha. So I haven't paid it. I didn't pay it for 10 years. Um, uh, for eight of those years, and every year I send them and I'm saying, I'm, I'm not filing tax reforms because I'm not paying. Oh, you, inform, you actively inform them and say, thank you, but no thank you. Yeah, I say, thank you, I'm not filing. Gotcha. Uh, they say, I'm not filing, you know, where I live. Now, it's not illegal not to file your taxes. And what they can do, the IRS, you don't file your taxes, they can go, okay, well, we're taking your house, your car, and all of your money in your bank. It's up to you to try to get it back, if you understand. But they never touch me, why? I've already paid over $50 million in taxes. I have not received $50 million in services. Yeah, I, I hear them also very loud and vocal. Uh, there were easier targets for them than me. But um, two years ago, I started speaking on international stages in, in London, uh, Bucharest, uh, Stockholm, uh, Beijing, Hong Kong, saying, hey, people, you don't want to pay taxes. I'm not saying you shouldn't, but if you don't want to, you know how to do it? Privacy coins and distributed exchanges. Uh -huh. You'll never have to pay another penny in taxes ever again because the government cannot ever prove that you've made any money. Mm -hmm. um, well, then they got angry. Uh, and when I started, I was the chairman, of the CEO of MGT, uh, the world's sixth largest Bitcoin mining company, $800 million valuation. Um, the SEC, immediately after I started uh, saying that, filed a subpoena against the company. Not me personally, but against the company. Now, when the SEC files a subpoena, you have to publicly declare it. But you may not say anything about what it's about. Um, so what was it about? It was about a past stockholder asking, please let us know uh, how much stock uh, he received. Uh, and for what? That was it. But since I couldn't di disclose that, I, I, but I had to disclose we've been subpoenaed, the New York Stock Exchange the following day delisted us. That's what they do. If, if someone files a subpoena, man, you get delisted. Our stock went from an $800 million valuation overnight to $3 million. Um, we had to fold the company. I left. Uh -huh. uh, that was their shot over the bell. Uh, the warning say, you better shut up. Or we'll destroy you. Well, that just made me mad, and I got more vocal. Um, uh, so the SEC couldn't do anything about me telling, don't pay taxes. So they got the IRS to file uh, to a convene a grand jury. I mean, it's all politics. So that's why I'm on the run from the U.S. I'm on the run from the Bahamas since they're after me because they we left six hours before they came to collect us. Wrong. We went to Cuba. We were in Cuba for two months, and the Cuban government grabbed Janice and I, uh, took us in to an army base. An army general came in and said, listen, Miss McAfee, we regret, uh, but the U.S. government has requested that we uh, return you to America. I'm going for a But he said, however, uh, we were disinclined to do so. But, Mr. McAfee, you understand, uh, you are now a serious problem to us if you remain in this country. Uh -huh. You have 72 hours to get out of the country. Now, we had a boat. Our captain, we were planning to be there for quite a while. Our captain was in Miami. Uh, it's a big yacht. You can't just power these suckers up and sail away. It takes mm -hmm. days. And they came sometimes twice a day. Go, Miss McAfee, are you sure you're going to be gone in 43 hours? Finally, I said, listen, if I have to swim to Haiti, I'm going to be gone. Uh, and we managed to get out 16 hours uh, ahead of the deadline. Um, we decided to go to the Dominican Republic. We told no one about it. But now the CIA arranged all of this shit, right? Um, and so we got to the Dominican Republic, pulled into dock, and we were arrested before we could get off the boat. And they said, Miss Backley, I'm sorry, but we have to ship you back to America. I said, well, that's not legal. I didn't come from America. I came from Cuba. By international law, if you want to ship me anywhere, you can either ship me to a country that I say I want to go to or the country I came from. Mm -hmm. You cannot legally send me to America. And, and so the head of immigration, I was sitting in his office when he said that. He said, see, Pedro Senor, it's muy, muy, muy complicado. 
meaning, yeah, I understand. However, this is a very, very, very complicated case. You're going back into America. <laughs> but we didn't. I mean, I, I got lawyers, and we, uh, four days later, by, by the way, jails in the Dominican Republic, I can't recommend them. Uh, I've been jailed in almost, I've been jailed literally in every continent except Africa. You started your namesake company in 1987, but obviously technology was a big deal for you before that. My, my question to you, sir, what's your first memory of computers? At what point did technology click for you? And you're like, ah, computers, technology, this is for me. When they first came out in 1968, um, as, as general purpose computers. I mean, they had massive things in government that had one million to the power of your smartphone. But um, so I, I, would, I went to, uh, I got a, a degree in mathematics, an uh, undergraduate bachelor's. I went to Louisiana State, then moved to Virginia Polytechnic working on a master's. I decided to take uh, the summer off. Uh, but I got a job at General Electric. I didn't even know what it was about. Uh, they were just looking for mathematicians. I'm one of the finest in the world, if I may say so. So I said, yeah, I'll go by. Um, uh, I went to a training program for three months. I didn't tell them I was going to go back to school. You know, at that age, I was deceptive. Uh, however, after three months, I realized, Jesus, this is what I want to do. Um, and it was the most technical, and still the most technologically complex and intense of all computer disciplines, process automation, real-time computing, if you know what that means. That means that you have a computer controlling a moving system in real time. And if, you, if you're off by a fraction of a millisecond, you might destroy a, a $2 million steel mill roller or something. So, and so I've, uh, I worked uh, for your automating Australia Iron and Steel's a steel mill plant uh, in Port Campbell, New South Wales, Australia. Uh, that's where I really learned what computers really were, how, they, how software and hardware are an interface issue and a really one thing. Um, and from there, I went to, I, I did so well. I got a job at NASA, uh, not just normal NASA, but their Institute for Space Studies uh, at Columbia University in, in Manhattan. Uh, there I was assigned uh, the data reduction of the world's first weather satellite, Tyros. Um, and that's also where I first learned that there is a thing called computer security, because they were terrified that the Russians or the Chinese get access to the data because no one else had any weather satellite, no satellites at all that were transmitting data. Um, and it had been transmitted data for years in the analog form. Um, and so they said, how do you deal with this? I go, fuck me, I don't know. But, you know, I was 25 at the time and, I, you know, I'm 25 will take on any project. Uh, and after a year, I had designed a system to reduce the data into a, not just a manageable form, but to an intelligible form. Um, and, and from there, um, I went to Univac, which at the time was the second largest computer manufacturer in the world, mm -hmm. uh, designing operating systems. I was the lead, I was, I was 25 years old, and the lead architect for Univac's operating systems. Uh, and that was my beginning. And this, wow. that was just an... 1970 was, was that, and I've been in computers ever since, yeah. and security ever since, because uh, uh, at NASA, I understood, oh, people are concerned about other people accessing data. Well, how interesting. As, as I understand it, you basically beat Skype and Instant Messenger to the chat and communication game in the 1990s. Do you feel like you get enough yes, I credit? With tribal, with tribal voice. However, at the time, the system was, was hot. We didn't have the bandwidth for it. I mean, this is when people were using T1 lines. Mm -hmm. That was the mm -hmm. fastest you could get. I, I, am, I am familiar. <laughs> I had okay. one to no. my house. So, absolutely. So, if we only had one user, uh, we were spectacular. It fell apart at 10. And, but nevertheless, we invented it. Voice, actually, voice, uh, we didn't have video at the time, voice only. Um, but we had, we were the first instant messaging system. Um, so, tribal voice. When I finally realized, you know, I'm sorry, the, the, the hardware, we were 15 years ahead, boys. And so we sold the company for $17 million to CMGI um, in Boston. 
and moved on to other things. I, I then uh, co-founded Zone Labs, uh, and uh, we sold Zone Labs after a year to Checkpoint for four hundred million dollars. Uh, out of eleven months' work. Okay? Wow. Uh, so people know me from McAfee, but no, that was not my greatest success. That was some trivial thing. It was my future things, which I did not attach my name to, uh, that taught me and, uh, and made me uh, all of my money. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of money, what were the circumstances in which you first gained familiarity with cryptocurrency? Uh, was, it, was it the invention of Bitcoin or did you have somebody walk you through no, no. it? How, okay, so how did you, how, how did you here's how that away? happened. Here's how that happened. I mean, at McAfee, I started collecting uh, prize employees, programmers. Um, uh, there are, in fact, programming is one of those strange fields where you can find people uh, who are worth a hundred other programmers. Mm -hmm. In truth, all right, this is a fact. And so I collected those. One of those was a genius named James Zeromsky. Worked for me at McAfee, uh, brought him with me to Tribal Voice, and he worked with me on a whole bunch of product projects after that. I hadn't talked to Jim in years because uh, I had stopped doing those things. I was simply out traveling and enjoying myself. I was in Belize. He called me, just chatted and said, I'm coming down. And I go, great, great. What, yeah, what are you doing? He says, I'm mining. <laughs> mining. But I didn't ask. I'm thinking, what's he mining? Gold? Uh, diamonds? Who knows? Silver? Copper? Uh, lead? I don't know. So he came down with his girlfriend. Um, I, I took him out the next day uh, on uh, by uh, sailboat. Um, uh, he and his girlfriend and you know a couple of dozen other people spent a couple of days out. And that first day we were sitting on the, the net up front. It's a catamaran. Uh, and uh, he handed me um, Bitcoin's white paper, mm -hmm. which I read uh, cover to cover in a matter of minutes. And being a mathematician, I was just interested in the math part of it. When I saw the brilliance of it, I go, holy shit, no wonder he came down. Hmm. And that's what got me involved. And I've been in crypto ever since. So, so do you care to talk at all about what coins you hold besides Bitcoin? Or is it all Bitcoin? I don't hold coins. Good luck. The only coins I hold are the coins that I use for business. I don't have, I, listen, we can't have, obviously we can't have a bank account and certainly mm -hmm. we can't have a credit card. We'd be picked up in a matter of minutes the first time we use a credit card. So we can't have a bank account, can't have a credit card um, and no way to get cash. So everything I do is crypto, Monero uh, or DAI. Um, oh, wow. So you're paying all your employees so in crypto? All Paying all of them. Every, every job that I take on, I get paid in crypto. If you can't pay me in crypto, I'm sorry, get, get oh, someone wow. else to do the work. Um, so everything. Uh, and not just employees, uh, everything from clothes to food to, to bulletproof vests and guns, you sure. can buy with crypto. So why bother with fiat and why bother with a bank? So we don't have such things anymore. Yeah. How do you, how do you buy clothes and food with crypto? Well, I, I go on to Google and um, I uh, search for a lot of uh, shirts, shirts, crypto. Uh, easy enough. That, that's, that's all you have to do. Please, people. It's an easy, it's an easy thing. Are you paying much attention to uh, Bitcoin's price fluctuations? Is that interesting Absolutely. to you at all? Bitcoin in no way, shape or form is even remotely interesting to me. Okay. I'm sorry. So I, I have no clue. I do know this, that the halving is coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Any day now, Bitcoin is going gonna, is gonna to skyrocket. Just like you did in a quartering. I mean, I was I was running MGT, the sixth largest Bitcoin mining company, mm -hmm. uh, during the quartering. What happened is Bitcoin went sky high, and after the quartering, it sank to next to nothing. The same thing's going to happen now. Mm -hmm. Soon, you know, you watch it. I promise you, you'll see the price slowly. It'll do this slow rise, slow rise, and an asymptotic curve just mm -hmm. before the the halving and then a instant crash afterwards. Um, and I guarantee this is gonna happen. But no, I don't pay any attention to it. Bitcoin is a useless coin, guys. Always has been. It's got no, please people, it's got no, it's got no privacy. You cannot put a smart contract on it, so what the hell is the blockchain for? Wow, wow. And you can't run distributed apps on it. It's an ancient yeah. use, and you think it's not? Find anybody in the world that takes Bitcoin anymore, nobody. 
on the, go on the dark web, which used to be all Bitcoin, not a single vendor who accept Bitcoin. It is 99.9% .9 Monero. Monero is the most widely used coin in the world. People go, oh, but Bitcoin is. No, nobody uses it. Bitcoin just happens to have, for some bizarre reason, not caught up to reality, and its market uh, value is the, is the largest. But its real value is nothing, because the real value has to be based on its original value. It is used as a currency. can't be used as a currency anymore. It doesn't work in the new world. I want to put a theory. I heard a theory earlier this week uh, during Virtual Blockchain Week. I want to put this to you and, and see what you make of it. And it, the theory basically says that uh, Bitcoin is enjoying a slight price bump this week because the U.S. government is minting money and slowly diluting the U.S. dollar. Does that square with you? Do you agree? Disagree? No, no, absolutely not. That's the having. Oh, it has already started. The yeah, climb has already we, started. We we saw. Uh, I think it was Tuesday night into Wednesday morning. It jumped about fifteen hundred bucks. So it, we're we're at that's a. That's a having, people. That's <laughs> a having. Oh, please. Cool. And look at the quartering. The same exact thing. Two weeks before, it started a bump, and it may go up to fifty thousand. I don't know, but it will crash instantly after the having. Got nothing to do with the U.S. dollar. All that is speculation. I mean, it's, it's, history is what we should be learning from, not just with Bitcoin, but sure. with everything in our life. Sure, sure. It, that tells us what will come because it does over and over, always. Why do you think the Pentagon's confirmation that UFOs are real isn't such a huge freaking deal? Why don't why is why uh, aren't, why aren't the, people in the streets about this is, screaming? That is the question, because really, it's, it's a very short um, uh, video, but if you look at it, you can clearly see this sucker traveling at massive speed stop, and it's, it's clearly a rotating object, and it spins, and in a physical impossibility for rotating object. How? And what the heck is it that rotates, and why did it rotate? It rotated a full. 110 degrees hmm. and then shot off we do not have the technology in the human uh, uh, species of technology to do that uh, so to me to have verification from the pentagon means one of two things aliens are here or the pentagon is fucking with us uh, i don't know which uh -huh. uh, no, but it's one of those two in either case it should be big deal why is the Pentagon lying to us and what are they trying to achieve? Or, holy shit, aliens are here uh -huh. for, for real. I don't know, but it didn't seem to be a big deal. And that's fine. I mean, <laughs> if people are more concerned about hiding from, an, you know, from a non-existing threat. Uh, that's fine with me. Let, let me ask you kind of a weird question uh, uh, about your experience of your own life, just because it's been such a full life from what, from what is publicly known. And I imagine what isn't publicly known only adds more to the story. You started, <laughs> you started a huge company. Your name is basically synonymous with antivirus protection. You've run a presidential campaign. You're married to a woman more than 30 years younger than you. You're on the law from law enforcement, including the United States. Uh, you were arrested for drug manufacturing and released without charges. You've written books about yoga. And I understand that some of these books take concepts like telepathy and time travel seriously. This strikes me as a full and unusual life. Does it feel unusual to you? No, it just feels, it feels hectic and out of control. <laughs> That's all. It, it has, no, I'm telling you, it has, seriously. Uh, it has been since I was 23. That's when all this shit started. I don't yeah. know. Listen, if you step out of the box, um, you're in an alternate universe, people. You don't really understand. Uh, people habituate their lives to following uh, what authority says. What are authorities? Well, the government, mm -hmm. um, teachers, uh, policemen, uh, the FBI, Congress. These are authorities. Um, and we have been habituated to both believe that these authorities are here for us, for our benefit. Well, <laughs> uh, you need to wake up they're here for their benefit what yeah. congressman what congressman truly uh is going to sacrifice their well-being for you knowing that listen 
uh, I'm going to lose money doing this, but it's good for the people. No, it's for them. Uh, and they will rationalize why, uh, for example, can we not be real for a second? Every congressman is a multimillionaire. Every single one, without exception. Few of them came into Congress as millionaires, and all of them became millionaires before their four-year term was up. Now, I want to ask you something. What, what magic is there about having the title congressman or senator? Is it that money flows from the heavens into your pocket? Wake up, people. That doesn't happen. So if that's really what's happening, <laughs> they do not have your interest in art. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have the lining of their pockets in art. This is just a fact of life, which we have to accept. So we we accept authority, uh, and we accept it for, for two reasons. Laziness. You know, we're uh, easier to let somebody else think for you, especially authority, and fear. And what's the fear? The fear of thinking incorrectly. That's the greatest fear that people have, making a wrong decision or a wrong choice. And if we make that decision ourselves, who is it that has to bear the burden, the responsibility? Ourselves. Mm -hmm. But if we let somebody else do it for us, uh, the government, uh, uh, the mayor, um, your boss, anybody but you, then if it's a bad decision, you're perfectly protected. It's that person that bears the responsibility. So these two things combined keep people in a box. And that box has extraordinarily narrow limits to it. Well, I John, just it seems decided, like so much of your life is about getting out of the box, John. But of course it is. That's all life is. If you, if, I don't want to be a habituated individual yeah. that thinks other people's thoughts and believes other people's beliefs. I want to see life for myself. And you can't do that inside the box because life is outside the box, people. Mm -hmm. So when I was in my 20s, I realized, well, you know, my entire life has been what my parents taught me to do, what my teachers taught me to do, what the police said I should do, what the government said I should do, what college said I should, well, no, Enough of this crap. I go, I'm just going to think for myself. Yeah. When I did so, <laughs> whoa, the world opened up. But, but let me tell you, you had better be prepared for what follows because it's not always comfortable. Mm -hmm. And it is always completely unknown and completely unpredictable and sometimes frightening and sometimes painful. Uh, sure. Janice, for example, was not remotely happy with her four days in the Dominican Republic jail, <laughs> right? Understood. Me, I've been in jails, more jails than, than God. It's like another jail for me. Um, you habituate even to those things. But if you don't want to go to jail, if you don't want people to want to kill you, if you don't want to have to run from governments, then stay in your box, people. Because you, that may not happen to you, but something equally as bizarre and frightening will. And this mm -hmm. is what you this is what you're risking. Get out of the box, you're in an unknown world. It's been there your whole life, people. Your entire life, that world is running in parallel with you. And it's been beckoning you. Come out and play. Come out and play. Yeah. I promise you will survive it. I'm 74 and I have survived uh, 50 two years of it. And I am I would not change a single second of this. I would not change my jail time. I would not change hiding in the jungles of the lease while bullets were flying over my head. I would not change a single thing. It's the stuff of movies, and, and there already is one, the documentary about your life, and then I also understand that there's some movie called King of the Jungle. Right, you, Michael heard... Keaton. Michael Keaton will be playing me, and Zac Efron will be playing the reporter. It's just right. about a two-week, a tiny two-week segment of my life. All right, but for the reporter who wrote the story or the script, Made a career. it was, the most, it was yeah. the most horrific, shocking, and terrifying experience of his life. And he unraveled went back and wrote this thing. So that's what the movie's about, is mm -hmm. less me and more of him. Of He listened to my, I manipulate the press, I admit. And what happened is, um, 
um, who was it? Wired, Wired Magazine contacted yeah. me, begged me to let uh, one of their reporters come and live with me for two weeks. And I go, yeah, I've never done that before. Well, I'm not going to say no because I've never done it before. Well, he was there for about six hours, and I go, Ooh. the only way this is going to work is that I'm just going to fuck with him the entire time, which uh -huh. I did. Uh -huh. And he did, by the end, he was a bubbling mass of terror, and it was just, so he went back. That's what this movie's about. How, how did you f*** with him? Setting off uh, oh, what, okay. well, guns the and day. stuff? I don't know. Well, you need to read the story, but let me tell you one, the, the most prominent one that everybody remembers because he wrote the story is the second day, I'm thinking, okay, it's not going to work, so uh, you're just mine, dude. Uh, you were stupid to come down here, and this is what you get. So we're talking. We're in, we're in my, uh, listen, I had houses all over the place, and we were sitting in one on the beach in this gorgeous, huge room, massive table in the middle, and he's sitting over here to my left, maybe eight feet away, and I'm sitting here, and we're talking. He's talking about my compound in the jungle and the, the antibiotic work that I'm doing there. While I'm talking, I pull out my uh, 38 revolver, I always am armed, pulled it out, and I'm still talking. Uh, I open a cylinder and dump the shells out. Um, uh, I reach in and take one and put it back, spin the cylinder, close it, and go, click! Okay? He jumped up, backed up, banged against the wall, and said, no, you don't have to do this! Stop, stop! And I said, stop what? Click! Open it again, spun it, click! I did it maybe 50 fucking times, uh -huh. right? Now, I'm a sleight of hand specialist, right? Now, how did I do that trick? What I always do, unless I am anticipating a serious problem, is with revolvers, I take uh, the bullet out, dump the, uh, uh, I dump the powder, put it back in, pop the cap, because you have to pop the cap, else it'll explode against your head, and you could damage yourself. Put the bullet back in, put it in the gun. How do I recognize it? Because when I dump them out, the bullet with no powder and the cap busted will have a tiny indentation where the firing pin fired the cap. Mm -hmm. So I'll take that bullet, put, pull it back in. You can click that a million times. It's not going to go off. Now, what was even better is that Dan said, calm down, calm down. It's, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. So I said, let's go outside. And he just need air. And he's, and he's just freaking out. You know, he's, got, he's got tears coming down his face, not from crying, but he doesn't know what else to do. He pissed himself, by the way. Uh -huh. wow. um, and so I take him out on the porch. And I said, it's okay. I pointed the gun at the sand, pulled the trigger, went boom, and the sand exploded, right? What did I do while I'm taking out? Because he's not looking at my hands. I take that bullet out, but live the man. Mm -hmm. um, so now, that was the mildest thing that I did with him while he was there. And you have to believe me, if I want to f with someone, <laughs> I would fuck with you. And that was the beginning. That was the mildest. That was nothing compared to what else I submitted him to. And when he left, he was a literally bubbling, incoherent. He lost his mind. And so this, this movie is about those two weeks. Gotcha. He was with me. Written by him. Are, have you heard anything from that reporter in the years since? Are you still in touch at all, I wonder? Josh Davis? Mm -hmm. No, why would I be in touch with him? I don't know. I, I don't know. If it, if it were me, yeah, I would be I writing would. you letters every day, to be honest. I think you're... No, no, he's never tried to contact me again. I mean, no one in the right mind would. If you had gone through what he went through, I'd be the last person in the world he'd want to hear from. Seriously. The last person in the f***ing world. Because I know how to, to mentally with people, you must trust me. Uh, and I literally destroyed his psyche. Why? He took up two weeks of my valuable time and he was an idiot. What idiot editor would send someone like him to spend two weeks with me and expect things to go well? No, absolutely not. Oh man. Um, yes. I, had, I had a transvestite. Okay, a man uh, dressed as a woman creep into his bed one night and start fondling his pirates. All right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, come on. I wow. mean, it's, it's, um, and that was mild. And I did this every hour of the day, something different, something different.
no. A smart man would have said, I'm out of here. Right, right. On the second, on this. In fact, smart man that didn't understand. No, he was also very stupid because seriously, come on. Who is going to sit there? And I also, it's a six six shot revolver. And I went, click, 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 <laughs> click, 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 click. <laughs> Please, God. A smart man would go, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. you're fooling me. Not him. Not him. Why? He was too panicked. He was expecting any second to see a head explode. Yeah. get splattered with blood. No, oh, come on, listen, you know. And and the transvestite, okay, uh, I made sure that, because uh, I paid him uh, very well, uh, I made sure that he was thorough uh, in his fondling. Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, we're, I'm totally yes. clear that you're not interested in Bitcoin, but a lot of people are. Oh, yeah. uh, do you have any theories on who this is? How do you of like Phil, Phil Zimmerman for Satoshi Nakamoto? Oh, no, please, God, absolutely not. Now, listen, uh, the, the people think that Satoshi designed Bitcoin. Nonsense. It was a team of 11 people over a period of five years that came up eventually with this. Um, how they decided who would write the paper, I don't have a clue, but... Anybody who wants to know who it is, I mean, you know who the options are. You've got Craig Wright, wants him. Um, I'm not going to name everybody else, else you'll figure it out. But um, uh, somebody wrote the white paper. Well, if you read the white paper, number one, it is totally clear he's English. Every single word that has a different spelling in English and American is English. Number two, he left tails. Um, there's only 5% of the population that has two spaces after a period. Mm -hmm. Everything was two spaces after a period. And the format of the document was identical to documents that he had published professionally. Uh, um, in, you know, professional academic publications. Identical. So now, uh, then if you buy a $200 authorship uh, program, and you take the white paper, you run it through, and you take any one of the papers that this guy wrote, or any all of these people wrote papers, by the way, uh, only one comes out with 99% probability as him. So I have spoken to him on the phone. I was actually going to divulge who he was. Why? Because all this nonsense was just stupid. People wasting time over nothing. I was going to say, listen, it's this guy. You know what he told me? A very smart motherfucker. He said, okay. Um, what if you're wrong? Because if you're right, um, that Satoshi is going to have to hire 50 security guards and change his life, yeah. uh, else he will die. Uh, or you know that this is going to happen. Um, why? Everybody's going to want a piece of him, including the governments that demand that he pay taxes on it. He said, "Okay, that, that's if you're right, then that person has the ability to do so. But what if you're wrong?" you will have destroyed an innocent man's life yeah. forever and probably caused his death. I go, whoa. At that moment, I said, I understand. And I'll say no more. Understood. And yeah. your name will never leave my lips, which is why I never continued to ask Craig Wright because the name would have to leave my lips, all right? So, um, but if you want to know, figure it out yourself, all right? I'm sure you remember, I think it was the year 2014, where they found a guy named Dorian Nakamoto and mistakenly outed him as Satoshi. And it, yes. it definitely upended his life. Yes. Yes. See, that's the issue. See, I'm a stupid old man. I, I don't think things through. Because uh, I said, I'm gonna, listen, I'm going to give all who he is and let's get over this nonsense and stop fucking speculating. But then his one thing, what if you're wrong? What if that 1% probability is what the reality is? You have destroyed a man's life. All right. <laughs> could, I, could I ask one, one indulgence before we go, John? I would love to take a screenshot, a screenshot of you holding up that AK behind you, if that's okay. How'd you know it's behind? I, I watched yeah, the presentation, man. Ah. Yeah, okay. Thank you, man. It's a proof that I know what I'm doing. Notice my trigger discipline is the greatest in the world. Okay? You're pointing it in a safe never, direction and everything. Never, uh, right, never touch the trigger until the moment you have acquired the target and are ready to fire. 
Otherwise, you will accidentally shoot yourself or someone else. Okay. So I know what well, I'm doing with guns. Always have. I believe That's you, man. It. Thank you again for your time. This was a real privilege, and I hope you guys are staying safe. All right. Thank you. Coin Telegraph. Like, subscribe, and hodl.